a real stranglehold on this format. Yeah, uh, we saw Brad actually, Brad Nelson played the Red White Burn deck at uh, Nashville a couple weeks ago. And the deck looked pretty solid. I think he started off 3-0 or 4-0. And uh, he was playing four Searing Blood main deck because it was so good with Seder Fire Dancer. But uh, it doesn't look like Vincent's playing those in the main, but he does have four in the board. So. We're under oh, no, I'm sorry, that's Fire Drinker Seder. I, yeah. Excuse me. We are underway here in uh, game number one of round nine. Ash Zellick going to come across here for Lakey. He does have Temple of Triumph and Mountain as his lands. Yeah. Seagal going to play a couple swamps and just pass the turn back, repping a removal spell. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems likely he's got Bow Blight or some removal spell here. If he doesn't have anything, he's just in a lot of trouble, but... There is Bio Blight going to take care of the SL. Phoenix is going to come across for two, and I know you have, obviously, a lot of experience playing Mono Black with two Grand Prix top eights with it. How much do you care about Chandra's Phoenix when it's across from you? Uh, I care about it a lot. Like, you don't have ways to exile it, and it's actually one of the reasons, not that card specifically, but other cards similar to it, is the reason why I'm considering playing Guild in the deck. Uh, Guild is a card out of Born of the Gods, which is a four-mana removal spell at sorcery speed that exiles a creature, uh, giving you a gold counter, of all things, that you can tap or that you can sacrifice it for an extra mana. The mana not as relevant in the, the current builds of the mono black because they are not really are they're very curve based and the more you just like hit your land drops, uh, you want to just like chain up to bigger spells. So you don't really want like one shot mana things. But being able to exile things like Afara, Thassa, Chandra's Phoenix, cards that are just normally very tough to deal with. Uh, is, is pretty cool. So, I mean, I, I haven't seen it catch on, obviously, at all, but I've been playing a little bit of Block Constructed on Magic Online, and it's been very good there, and I feel like it could very easily translate to real life, so. Seagal going to come across with Nightfell Spectre. It leads me that he might have another one. That Desecration will do, Demon will do just fine as well. So he reels in Muta Vault. Won't be able to play that until next turn. But the 6-6 six, six is in play here for Mono Black. On the other side, like he just played a Boros Reckoner and passed the turn back. Thus draw a Sacred Foundry, and he's going to play that Foundry untapped. So we'll see what he has on this turn. Yeah, it looks like he's going to Chain of the Rocks to Desecration Demon, get that out of here. And then probably has a three drop since he did uh, shock himself here. You so see, After he organizes where he puts the chain right. and everything, he's got another and that's, Phoenix. This is really bad for Michael, obviously, because uh, him attacking with the uh, Nightville Spectre means that he basically took four points of damage for not a whole lot of value. He did get the Muta Vault from Vincent, which is pretty key, but if he had hit any red spell and stalled on the land there and not been able to play the Grey Merchant of Asphodel, he would have been just actually dead. So, so Grey Merchant's going to be a drain for five and a gain for five, more importantly. So Sagal goes to 11, Lakey's at 14. Lakey's going to play, it looks like Sacred Foundry untapped again. They're going to go down to 13. Yeah. This or feels like me, Storm Red Dragon. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is. So now the 4-4 Flyer has shown up, and again, he's just going to attack with everybody, and yeah. this is a really, really bad spot here for Seagal. Yeah, I mean, he's not at a very high life total, but his opponent also isn't very high on life either, and he does have two Muta Vaults. He has eight power total in play. Uh, if he peels another Grey Merchant, he's going to have Exaxes uh, for the drain damage coming back. Uh, if he soaks it all here, he's going to take uh, nine. But if he blocks with Grey Merchant, then his Grey Merchants off the top are no longer live to actually kill his opponent. So he's actually playing pretty well here to give himself the draw, how, or the, the outs to draw a Grey Merchant. However, if he doesn't draw it, I'm pretty sure he's just dead. And another Swamp with a Thought Season hand is not going to cut it against this board full of really tough to be monsters from Vincent. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a tough spot there. And, you know, we go back to the Nightfell Spectre attack, should he have made that attack in the first place? And it's uh, pretty difficult to say, especially when you have Desecration Demon, because obviously Red White has a very small number of answers to that card. It's basically Chain of the Rocks. So, sure. you know, you're basically saying, do you have Chain of the Rocks or not right now? Yeah, and uh, Michael here, he has the potential to not actually be dead uh, if Vincent has absolutely nothing, uh, which he has no cards in hand. So uh, the way that... Michael can actually play this turn as he can attack with uh, at least one Muta Vault, possibly both, and then block Boris Reckoner and the uh, Stormbreath Dragon, taking two from the Reckoner's triggered ability and two from the Chandra's Phoenix, uh, keeping him at one life with Vincent at seven. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he's leaving himself with virtually no outs because both of his creatures are going to be... Uh, well, maybe the Great Merchant doesn't die, but... Uh, well, somebody drew a spell here. I believe Lakey did. Yeah, feels like another shot of Phoenix. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever they start separating their lands into a pile of, you know, two or three, it's usually pretty easy to tell what's coming. And uh, it looks like that's going to close the deer door here for, for Michael. So. Yeah, everybody comes sideways. If Nightfell Spectre gets in front of Storm Breath and this way, and then Boris Reckoner's Triggered Ability just goes upstairs. Yeah, he's just going to dome him for two, and Michael's only out as if he misses the Boris Reckoner trigger, but... Yeah, okay. and he says, yep, that's going to go upstairs, and that's going to do it. So Vincent Lakey is going to win game, game number one, excuse me, over Michael Siegel. 
Red White Aggro up a game over Black Green Devotion. Now you've got Seagull sideboard in front of you. So let's take a look at those 15 cards and see what you would do. Sure. So uh, his sideboard has a lot of cards that are very good against like most aggressive decks. Like he has a Singleton Doomblade, some Lifebane Zombies against like Green White, uh, and you know like Golgari Charm's pretty good against like Master Waves and uh, a few other cards. But Honestly, against like red decks like this, you need to be cutting Underworld Connections and Thoughtseize, and he just doesn't really have enough like actual cards to bring in. Like bring in Lifebane Zombie is okay, but doesn't really do exactly what you want him. Much better in the versions to play like one or two Whip of Erebos because then you can actually start using those to race. The three power becomes more relevant. Here, you know, he's gonna get real lucky on the play if he hits a Boris Reckoner out of Vincent's hand. Uh, or, you know, perhaps just apply some pressure and draws like a lot of removal back up and Vincent doesn't have a, a removal heavy draw. But uh, other than that, he doesn't have a whole lot going on. Maybe wants a couple duresses to, you know, hit all the removal spells, but he also doesn't know Vincent's list per se. And all we saw that game was Chain of the Rocks and like seven creatures. So yeah. it could be he doesn't bring in duress. And I think duress could end up being a big player in this game, being able to strip away one of the uh, Chain of the Rocks out of Vincent's hand. Uh, to protect his Desecration Demon or even his Life Pain Zombie. But, uh, yeah, considering what he saw, it seems unlikely that he's going to be bringing in Duress. Lakey's sideboard over here is a little bit different. He's got four Fire Drinker Satyrs, a card that we've seen in the sideboard of Red White Devotion decks to be able to have a more aggressive start. We'll see if those come in here, especially with Lakey on the draw. It'll be a little interesting. Four Skull Cracks seem like they're pretty good in this particular <laughs> matchup. Shut down those Grave Merchants, yeah. shall we? Man, I got so much to say about Skull Crack, and I don't think any of it would be uh, able to be put on air. So. <laughs> two copies of Missing Mortars, two Spark Troopers, two... Uh, faded conflagration and then a, another chain of the rocks to go along with the three in the main deck. I, I, I predict we'll probably see that fourth chain of the rocks come in because shutting down either Night Veil Spectre or Desecration Demon is pretty important here. Yeah, I agree. And I think that along with the four Fire Drinker Seder is actually a pretty solid plan. Fire Drinker Seder being one of the uh, uh, ways you can sideboard into a much more aggressive shell against decks like Black Green Devotion and Blue Eye Control. Uh, one of the easiest ways for you to get a leg up against black decks is to just flood the board. Not a whole lot of them. Uh, play Drown in Sorrow or even really would want it in this matchup because it doesn't kill that many creatures. And so you can kind of safely assume that not uh, everyone is going to be uh, on that card. So having a lot of cheap creatures to apply pressure, sort of bottleneck the removal because your creatures all cost less mana than the removal spells, and then hopefully finish them off with a few burn spells at the end. Now you mentioned something when uh, when uh, Seagull was sideboarding that I think is a really interesting thing that you brought up, and it has to do with Thoughtseize. Uh, you know, a lot of people have varying opinions on how Thoughtseize is against a red-white aggro deck or a base red blitz deck where, you know, the thought process is, well, this card's probably going to deal me more than two points of damage so I can leave Thoughtseize in and be able to take something that's going to deal me more than two, and that's actually productive in addition to getting information of what their hand is. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there is some merit to leaving in Thoughtseize in matchups like this. Like, there are some times where I'll be playing some, like, Legacy, for example, and I'll have Thoughtseize in my deck and I'll leave it in my deck because being able to take stuff like Flame Rift, Fire Blast, etc., gives you those few points of life. However, without something like Brainstorm in your deck or a way to, you know, other than Pack Rat to turn it into, like, you know, uh, not card parity. I, I don't know what I'm trying to really say. I'm I mean, basically <laughs> turning it into something that so, is useful. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you draw Thoughtseize on turn seven or whatever, it's not going to do anything at all. And uh, it, it's just not a card that I ever want to draw uh, other than on turn one. Because, I mean, being able to strip, like, a Stormbreath Dragon or uh, an Ash Zealot on turn one is, is fine. But in a matchup like this, you want all of your cards to be good at every single point in the game. Uh, and if you don't have your deck set up like that, it's going to be very easy for you to draw too many awkward cards in awkward situations. Like, for example, there's the old saying of there are no wrong threats, only wrong answers. Mm -hmm. And I think that holds very true to this matchup in particular, as well as standard in general. Because... All, all, if you see like all the mono blue devotion decks and things like that are just very uh, threat oriented and they just force the opponent to have the supreme verdict, force them to have the bile blight uh, or you know something to interact with them and it's, not, it's really hard to have all those, all those answers. So. Well speak about forcing to have an answer. Magma Jet here for Pack Rat. Certainly important that you killed immediately in this matchup. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, Vincent doesn't really have anything in his main deck. He does have the potential of bringing Mizium Mortars, but if uh, the Pack Rat, you know, gets one or two copies in play, can very easily race, you know, any sort of medium-sized threat that he could put on the table. Boris Reckoner does brick wall it for a little bit, allow you to buy some time to fly over the air with Chandra's Phoenix, Storm Breath Dragon, or just use your burn spells, like, aggressively, but uh, definitely want to kill that on site for the most part.
So you've a very, very land heavy hand. You're going to see Lakey cast a Magma Jet here on the end step to go upstairs to Seagull. Put him down to 18, and more importantly, Scry 2 and set up the rest of this game. Yeah, and this is actually something we were talking about before the broadcast. People, I think, cast Pack Rat on turn two way too often in this format. Uh, obviously, if you have an early discard spell and you take their one removal spell, it's fine because then you can start making pack rats on turn three. But in this matchup, the black green deck has to just be the control deck, and you can't end up getting flooded at any point in the game. And pack rat on turn five allows you to discard your like six land or your superfluous like uh, you know removal spell if like you know your opponent isn't playing very very many creatures like Vincent's doing this game. Here, Michael's just playing like Vasara on five. If this was a pack rat and making a token, he might have the potential to actually just take over the game or turn one of his lands into a way to force his opponent to discard like Magma Jet, which would be huge. So we see Vraska show up here, and this is a little bit interesting because I don't know if we've ever had assassins uh, on camera. <laughs> I'm not saying, I don't think, I don't I don't think it's impossible. Those, I, don't think, I don't think we've got those tokens laying around. I'm huh? not sure if we do either, but we're getting pretty close. It only takes seven to get up to the assassin tokens, which could actually be a path to victory here for Seagull. I say it's something to think of for you guys at home. You might see a, a one-shot kill here. Yeah, Vraska, uh, a pretty sweet card in its own right. I personally love this card. Like. It comes in with so much loyalty. It's one of the very few Planeswalkers, like, sim similar to like Jace Architect of Thought, where you just have to send so many things at it to kill it because it has such a high loyalty, but punishes the opponent for trying to interact with it. You know, the the whole flavor, I love it with, you know, it's it's a Gorgon, and if you look at a Gorgon, come face to face with it, you just explode into a pile yep. of rocks or whatever. So uh, I definitely love Raska as both flavor and just a card in general, so. Here's a Temple of Triumph from Lackey, so he's looking for something to scry. He's going to put, looks like this card's going to go down to the bottom. Taking a look at uh, Lakey's hand right now as well, he does have Skullcrack, he also has Chain of the Rocks. He doesn't have a lot going on. As Fire Drinkers here is going to come across here, there's a Devour Flesh to take care of that. Yeah, I think this would actually be a prime spot uh, for Michael. He's, I think he's actually just about to take over the game because uh, Vincent doesn't really have a whole lot going on. He had a very burn-heavy draw, not a lot of creatures. You know, turn six, Fire Drinker Seder, not going to get the, the job done. Or excuse me, turn five. Uh, and Michael's hand just looks like it's full of removal spells. It looks like he's probably on the Assassin plan because Vincent is very unlikely to have Mizzy Mortars in his deck after after game one. So, so Skullcrack put uh, Vraska down to four. It's going to take up to five now. Mutavolt's going to come into the red zone. It's going to knock Lakey down to 19. And he's going to pass the turn back now. Again, uh, Siegel does have a Golgari Charm in his hand. Also has Hero's Downfall as well. So creatures are actually <laughs> kind of under lock here a little bit. Yeah, and the, the funny part is that uh, Vincent, with his Chain of the Rocks in hand, is going to hopefully get, you know, Desecration Demon or something, and then he's just going to get blown out by Golgari Charm and <laughs> That's you know, true, yeah. smash in the face for eight points of damage alongside the Mutavolt. And uh, not to mention just the Vraska threatening to kill Chain of the Rocks. Vraska's just insane. I just I just want to point out how much I love that card and how much work it's doing in just this game. It's already taken a shot from a skull crack. It's threatening to invalidate multiple cards out of Vincent's deck. His next creature is going to get destroyed unless it's a Stormbreath Dragon and... Oh, no, even if it's Red Dragon, it's just, yeah. it can't attack Frasca and then just gets minus out of the game, basically, so. Yeah, it can be, you know, kind of a, you know, Fire Blast impersonation at best, yeah. as there's a Chandra's Phoenix. That's going to show up to the party now. That's going to go attack, and we'll see where it's going to go, if it's going to go towards Frasca, oh, in which case it would top. die, or if it's going to go up top. Yeah, yeah, it's going up top. Michael's going to 14 or killing it. Uh, yeah, killing Heck. is not a terrible play here. Conserving your life total, and, you know, Vincent's already shown that he is willing to throw burn spells at Vraska, so uh, it's very likely he's out of gas, and that means that you just want to preserve your life total, keep battling with your Mutavolt, and uh, hopefully just make sure Vraska is able to ultimate next turn. Mutavolt comes across for two there from Vincent. Now here's another Chandra's Phoenix off the top. It's going to come across for two. Devour Flesh is going to take care of that one. We want assassins. We want assassins. I know I we mean, already have an assassin because Mutavolt's in play, <laughs> but we want assassins. <laughs> That's a right? good point. Wait, does that work with Vraska or do only the assassins have I'm pretty the sure only the assassins have the ability. That it's actually on them. Doing. Oh my goodness, we are doing assassins. Oh, I, I like the I'll, spotter has yeah, the three yeah. tokens available immediately. Yeah, that's insane. I, I can't imagine there have been too many Vraska ultimates on camera over the last decade. <laughs> Let draw. That's it! The assassins are going to get the job done! Let him attack. That have, is so have, have some class. Let him attack. Seagull is going to tie it up here between him and Lakey. 
I didn't expect to see that. Now, we've seen some crazy things today. We've seen multiple Bramble Crushes be cast during a game from Good. Chris Finnell. Good. Uh, we see Assassin <laughs> Tokens getting the job done now at the 7-1 table. Yeah, yeah. I like what we're working with in Standard. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that you brought up Bramble Crush actually just makes me really happy because I was playing the... Uh, Green Blue Devotion deck a few weeks ago in That's Nashville. That's what Fennel was playing, yeah. And uh, my opponents played Underworld Connections on their land. Unbeknownst mm. to them, I had Bramble Crush at the ready. That is a delight. <laughs> That's what we call a two-for-one in the business. Well, assuming they didn't get to draw a card. But yes. yes. Yeah, that is a, that is a nice, nice little play there. As we are even up here in round number nine yeah. of our standard open, we'll see how players to opt to sideboard here. But, you know, as someone who plays Mono Black, obviously you don't play the green version very much, and with two Grand Prix top eights with the deck, how do you feel about playing a, against a deck that's kind of this aggressive red deck when you're playing Mono Black? Well, if they have the draw like they had in game one, it can be a nightmare if your deck, or if your hand is full of creatures and not full of removal spells. Uh, that game, Michael's hand was really well set up against creatures, and Vincent did not draw very many, so he was able to very easily take control of the game, and basically any finisher at that point would have been fine. Like, Desecration Demon would have been fine because he had Golgari Charm to kill Chain to the Rocks, uh, and actually probably would have won the game a little bit faster than uh, than the Assassin Tokens, though with not nearly as much flair. That's true. <laughs> that's true, and that's really what's important. Yeah, I mean, you got to look cool on camera, and Michael's looking like a champion right now, so... Yeah, I don't know if we're going to see these mono red, deck, mono red decks or base red aggressive decks pick up at all or not. Again, Slater Fire Dancer is, a, a, you know, a, a unique card. I know Brad tried to work with it um, to, you know, little, a little success, but nothing really all that notable. And then Searing Blood, well, it's fine. I mean, dealing two damage or something isn't the same as dealing three. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I mean, I think that they know better than to reprint Searing Blaze yeah. in general. I mean, Searing Blood is not even remotely close to as powerful, and... I, I think that if Searing Blood is in the format, then red decks would actually just be murderous, you know? It would be much better. I mean, the fact that they could actually kill Nightfield Spectre and things would be really, really nice. Yeah, I mean, the whole point of Fire Drinker Seder in general is, or not Fire Drinker, uh, Seder Fire Dancer in general is that all of your burn spells that go to the dome are also Searing Blazes, right? Yeah. Like your Skull Cracks kill creatures. And that was one of the reasons why Brad was trying to play uh, Fire... Uh, I, I, Seder Fire Dancer. Seder Fire I got Dancer. you. I got you. Well, I keep looking at Fire Drinker Seder out of <laughs> Lakey's sideboard and... You know, they're both satyrs, they're both fiery. They are v both very fiery. Yeah, so. That's because they're red, just yeah. so that you know. I could work for wizards. I could design cards. <laughs> Fire something. Yeah. Breathing, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Blast, burn, it's easy. Yeah. I was actually very surprised that Dissolve was a not a card name already. It just, like, when, when I saw that Dissolve was getting printed, I was like, hey, it's another counterspell. Really? Dissolve hasn't been counterspell yet? There's a little like, surprised, there's yeah. There's Dissipate, there's, you know... All sorts of Ds. Well, apparently, the, the English language is very vast. So that's always one of my fears is, are we going to run out of cards? why don't we use it well enough? That's I don't know. I, I don't know. I always <laughs> wonder if we're going to run out of you know names for cards. You know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of cards coming for the next oh. couple of years here. Yeah, that's true. All right. Well, looks like we're about to get underway here. I feel I think, uh, from what I saw at least, I think Michael's hand might be a little mana light. But uh, he's got a lot of gray merchants, maybe a few removal spells. Looks like, yeah, he left it in. There we go. Let's take a look here at Lakey's hand. You see a Sacred Foundry, a Temple, a Mountain, a Lightning Strike, and a Chandra's Phoenix. So, not a bad hand. No, uh, I think Michael's probably going to take the Lightning Strike here because if he takes the Chandra's Phoenix, uh, Vincent can just Lightning Strike him on two, get back the Phoenix, and then attack with it on turn three. So, you know, if Michael's hand has a few removal spells in it so that he can uh, keep this uh, Fire Drinker Seder and hopefully the Chandra's Phoenix from uh, doing him too much damage, he does have what it looks like a Night Vale Spectre and a Grey Merchant of Asphodel in hand to hopefully come back uh, later in the game and sort of take control, which is obviously exactly what this kind of a deck wants to do against these more aggressive red decks. Mutavolt was the draw here for Lakey, and I think he can play Mutavolt, pump Fire Drinker Seder and come in, but he opts to play Mountain instead. Yeah. Pass the turn. I'm not sure like that. You know, you're you're giving away a little less information that way. I guess he can just wait until next turn and play the Muta Vault and then cast Chandra's Phoenix, so it's yeah. not too much different. Uh, Boros Charm here, the draw for Vincent. And, you know, Michael's already at 15. He's got a Bob Light. He's going to be going to 13 here after the, the damage. But then the Muta Vault and another two-power creature maybe gets brick-walled by the, uh, the Night Vale Spectre, but also probably going to have to shock himself off his... Uh, his overgrown tomb in hand as well, so but draws the swamp like a, a true master for his Nightfell Spectre. So that's a that's a huge swing in the game. Yeah. Now it looks like Michael's hand has multiple gray merchants, a muta vault, and an overgrown tomb. So if he's able to survive for a few more turns, he's going to take control of the game. Nightfell Spectre does a great roadblock impression here. 
Foul uh, Flush not looking so bad either. He can target, obviously, Vincent or himself. Yeah. A little bit of life. The problem here is that Vincent does have the uh, Boris Charm in hand, so the Devour Flush not going to do a whole lot other than just buy two damage, basically. But uh, that might be enough to just let him chain Grey Merchants to uh, just grind Vincent into the ground. His deck can't really handle those five-point life swings. You know, he can only be so aggressive against these removal spells. And then Michael's obviously trying to gain this board advantage with Nightvell Spectre and then eventually close the game out. And even if it's just a motley crew of two power creatures, it's usually going to be good enough if he has enough removal spells. You know, there are some red decks that can actually take, you know, the swings of a five-point life game from the opponent. You know, we've seen versions that have, like, you know, Ashenmore Gorger in the past, things like that. This is not one of those red decks. Yeah, an interesting attack here from Vincent. I feel like he has two Boros Charms in hand, and I think what he's trying to do is, uh, I thought he was going to try to double strike the Mutal Vault to kill the Nightvale Spectre. However, it looks like he's just trying to grind as much damage as possible. But uh, Michael here going to drain for five, and next turn going to do the same thing except for seven, and it looks like he's just going to close the game out very quickly. And I fully expect Michael to jam here for two with the Nightvale Spectre to uh, hopefully close Vincent's life total a little faster. But... Taking the defensive route here, decides yeah, to hold back to protect from the, the Phoenix. Not a, not a bad play. You see the Boros Charm here on the end step. It's going to knock Siegel down to 12 now. The lake, he's starting to flood out a little bit. And I, I kind of use the term flood, you know, a, a little bit cautiously here, mostly because, like, you know, if this deck draws more than four lands, it's in a lot of trouble. Yeah. It's so important for them to draw a high number of spells, and Lakey's deck has 24 lands in it. That's a lot of lands for this, side of, this sort of, you know, hyper-aggressive red deck that we see. Yeah. Uh, pretty surprised here that Vincent didn't block with the Chandra's Phoenix. I know that the two damage doesn't matter all that much, but with the Boar Charm in hand, that feels like with so many lands in play and, and an extra land in hand still, having that Boar Charm uh, to get back the Chandra's Phoenix to save yourself two points of life could matter, especially now that Grey Merchant's going to come down next turn and there are uh, a lot of creatures in play on Michael's side. You see Vincent drew another land for the turn, so he's sitting with just the Boros Charm as his only spell. And I like what uh, I like what Michael's done here is, you know, he could have played another Grey Merchant last turn if he wanted to, but he's really, you know, kind of a little slow build up here to, to a huge Grey yeah, Merchant. Yeah, I mean, he made a, uh, a calculated decision that um, it was pretty unlikely that Vincent was going to burn him out from 12. And, uh, you know, now he's just going to attack and play Grey Merchant and finish him off, so... So Michael Siegel is going to win this match over Vincent Lakey. Two games to one. Black Green Devotion does defeat Red White Aggro. And with any luck for uh, Siegel, he'll be able to draw into the top of the next round, depending on breakers and all that good stuff. But, you know, we don't see Black Green Devotion a lot 